Hey everyone, it's Sevi. If you're a longtime Battle Pass buyer, you've probably gotten tired of looking at the same five choices over and over again. So I'm glad that we finally get more variety with these five new weapons. In this video, I'm going to discuss each of their stats and passives, which characters they might be best fit for, and how they compare to the OG Battle Pass weapons or other relevant peers. Considering that these are paid options, here's a quick reminder that for a lot of characters, there are already good free-to-play weapons out there, especially with Fontaine's new additions, which I discussed in a previous video. Video, such that getting a BP just for a weapon upgrade is quite unnecessary. But if you're already buying the BP, then you're probably here to find out which weapons to prioritize anyway. If that's the case, then let's just get into it. The first weapon on the list is the new sword, the Wolf Fang. It comes with 510 base attack, 27.6% crit rate, and a very sleek appearance. Also, its passive is really good. First, it gives a skill and burst damage bonus. This is a nice contrast to the Black Sword, which gives a normal attack bonus. So now the BP swords give options for units depending on which talents their damage is more skewed towards. But in addition to that, Wolf Fang's passive gives a stacking crit rate bonus, which can be triggered by the skill or burst hitting enemies. These exist separately with their own duration and trigger cooldowns. Now, it's very important to note the conditions of how these stacking bonuses apply. First, the crit rate bonuses gained only apply to the skill and burst attacks respectively. They are not a universal crit rate bonus, and that's also why you won't see the crit rate at the character's stat page increase, even if you've supposedly gained the bonuses. And second, the stacks can only trigger if the user does their skill or burst hits while they're on field. This means that off-field units can have a harder time stacking these, as they need to spend some time on field or quick swap back and forth in order to accumulate and maintain the stacks. With that said, the potential is still incredibly high if the unit has little to no problem getting the stacks and if their damage is heavily dependent on their skill, burst, or both. At R5, that's an additional 16% crit rate at full stacks on top of the crit rate substat, which means this weapon can give a maximum of 43.6% crit rate to a character's skill or burst attack. For context, that's nearly identical to the Jade Cutter, our premium 5 star crit rate sword, making an R5 Wolf Fang have the potential to be competitive even with R1 5 star swords. One great example here would be Al Haytham, whose projection attacks are counted as skill damage. On him, an R5 Wolf Fang outputs very close damage to an R1 Jade Cutter, which is his next best weapon after his signature, so that speaks to just how strong the Wolf Fang can be. It's possible to use it on some off-field burst units as well, like Sing Cho, but you'd have to spend some time dealing burst damage while they're on field before switching them off. So that they can get the maximum crit rate bonus. It's also easier if they're on quick swap teams, as that will make refreshing the duration easier when you switch them back on the field. Overall, this weapon is very strong with the various bonuses it gives, making it one of the best BP options in my opinion. And this might foreshadow the release of more sword users who are skill and burst dependent, which should make its value go higher when such units eventually release. Next is the Talking Stick, which comes with 565 base attack and 18.4% crit rate. But what makes this one arguably the weirdest one of the new group is that this is the first time I've seen a passive that's dependent on the wearer being affected by certain elemental auras, not an opponent. Specifically, if the wearer is affected by Pyro, they get an attack increase. If affected by Hydro, Cryo, Electro, or Dendro, they get an elemental damage bonus increase. And it's possible to get both buffs at once. However, the circumstances under under which your character gets affected by a certain element will depend on a few things. One, if the enemies have elemental attacks. Two, if there's an environmental factor like burning grass or abyss nodes like those that emit pyro. Or three, if the wearer or teammate has an elemental self-application ability. And in that regard, here's a list of units and abilities that can accomplish this. Now, it's true that whatever bonus you get from the passive will likely be appreciated by the wearer since it's attack and or elemental damage bonus. If it were the only claymore on the battle pass, it wouldn't be that bad of a pickup, but the Serpent Spine exists and it's still overall the better claymore between the two. In the long time it's been around, Serpent Spine has been found to perform competitively with 5-star claymores thanks to its crit rate stat and high universal damage bonus, which maxes out at 50% at R5. It does have its own conditions, of course. The passive takes time to stack up, but in Abyss, you can put your Claymore user in the first slot to pre-stack it. It also causes your character to take more damage, but that isn't too much of a concern if the Claymore user is primarily off-field, and on-field units can make use of strong shields and dodging skills. Compare that to the proc conditions of the Talking Stick. If you're trying to get both passives, deliberately and consistently, proccing them at once could end up calling for some unusual and likely suboptimal team comps, which isn't worth doing just to proc a weapon passive. And if you're only able to proc one 
one of its passives, its damage potential is generally lower than the Serpent's Spine. Perhaps in the future, we'll get a unit who can self-apply an elemental aura and perform well with teammates that also self-apply auras in order to consistently take advantage of the Talking Stick's passive. But as of now, we don't really have good candidates or scenarios to really maximize the weapon. Having said that, I would still recommend choosing Serpent's Spine for its consistently better damage output. If you've already maxed its refinements out and were considering Talking Stick as an additional Claymore, just getting another copy of Serpent's Spine would be better. Of course, if you don't want to put up with the nuances of the Serpent's Spine or just want a fresh new Claymore, who am I to stop you from talking to your stick? Now we have the Ballad of the Fjords, the new pole arm. This has 510 base attack, 27.6% crit rate, and a passive that buffs elemental mastery if you have three or more elements in the party. Our main candidates that come to mind are Hu Tao and Sino. On Hu Tao, the Ballad's closest peers would be the Deathmatch and Dragon's Bane, so let's compare those. At R1, the weapons are very closely matched up, and their performance can vary depending on whether Hu Tao is using an HP Sans or EM Sans. But once upgraded to R5, Ballad's passive gets the most most value and can give more EM than Dragon's Bane. As such, it climbs higher than its competitors. Overall, Ballad is a great 4-star weapon for Hu Tao. I guess one limitation is that you can't play the Funerational team since it's only two elements in the party. As for Sino, Deathmatch can still win out in a pure aggravate team due to him just preferring the higher crit rate and attack buffs. But in a Quick Bloom team, where he'll also be proccing Hyper Blooms, the Ballad's EM passive will help a lot and skew Sino's choice in its favor. There are other potential users, of course. A reverse Mount Rosaria, though you can't go the straightforward 2 Cryo 2 Pyro team since it won't proc the passive, so bringing in an Animo could work. A Hyper Bloom Raiden, since it technically becomes the highest EM pole arm at R5. And of course, there's always Shang Ling, who, outside of Mono Pyro, often has another Elements plus Animo unit on the team. So, all in all, it's a solid weapon that becomes the EM alternative to Deathmatch, and has a couple of strong potential users already. Up next is the Sacrificial Jade, and I low-key wish they had named it something else to distinguish it from the actual Sacrificial series. Anyway, the Sack Jade maxes out at 454 base attack and 36.8% crit rate. Its passive is a bit unusual though, because it increases HP and EM, triggers from being off-field, and is removed by being on-field for too long. Activating the buff and having it active during the Catalyst's field time likely won't be an issue since even if the character likes being on field, you will typically want to rotate back through your teammate abilities after 10 seconds or so. Additionally, most characters will appreciate that meaty crit rate stat, but we don't really have any character yet that can fully appreciate the HP and EM buffs that come with it, unless you want to play crit Komi. I think there's a big chance that Sacrificial Jade will be really good on an upcoming Fontaine unit since Fontaine characters so far have been playing into those HP dynamics, so it'll likely become a good pickup down the line. But for now, its BP peer, the Solar Pearl, has a more general applicable passive buff that will likely serve your current units better than your Sacrificial Jade will. Also, if you're lucky enough to pull the Widsis from Gacha, that pretty much already outclasses the Solar Pearl. There may be a use case for a quick swap Yae who may not want to spend the extra on field time proccing the Solar Pearl's passive and can make use of the EM, but I wouldn't really advise getting the Jade just for that case. So right now, Sacrificial Jade is a lower priority BP weapon. It is really pretty though, so I hope its ideal users come along soon. Last is the Cyan Bow, with 565 base attack and 18.4% crit rate. To summarize the passive, it deals an extra instance of damage, then inflicts an effect very similar to how Takabe Shigure works, wherein it increases the charge attack damage your character deals, but only to one marked enemy at a time, making it most effective in single target scenarios, but less consistent in multi target combat. By itself, it's a good bow, and becomes a new great choice for charge attack focused bow DPSs, but it's kind of in the middle in comparison to its. Peers. Viridescent Hunt, the OG Battle Pass bow, has a higher crit substat, making it a nicer crit stat stick, plus a vortex for crowd control and a bit of extra damage. If we look at Sign's charge attack buff, we can compare it to the Hamayumi. On someone like Melt Ganyu, who can get the full passive of the Hamayumi, the charge attack buff of Hamayumi is only a bit lower, but isn't limited to single target, so it may not necessarily be worth the upgrade in that regard. Of course, Sign distinguishes itself with its crit rate passive, still making it a suitable weapon if you're trying to to improve your crit stat, and then other charge attack units that don't utilize the Hamayumi as effectively, such as Linny or Tignari, the Zion is an okay pickup. But on Linny, for example, the new Song of Stillness performs very closely to Zion, so due to how good our craftable bow options are, you may be better off prioritizing other battle pass weapons for now. 
So all in all, there are a few cases where these weapons absolutely stand out, such as Wolf Fang being Alhatham's very competitive 4-star option, or the Ballad of the Fjords being amazing with Hu Tao and Sido. But generally speaking, these weapons do have specific effects that are quite conditional or have yet to see their most ideal users. We also have craftables, free-to-play rewards, and gacha weapons that may have very little difference versus these BP weapons at R1. These can pull ahead at R5, but of course, refinements will take a very long time. My main criteria for recommending which one you get is ultimately based on what you're lacking. If you find yourself using multiple sword users quite often, but have very limited good sword options, then getting the wolf fang will help fill in that gap. New players who are light spenders will also find more value in these BP weapons since they may not have gotten the great free weapon rewards at previous events or they haven't built up a good selection of weapons yet. But of course, don't ignore the first wave of BP weapons as some of them are still competitive or even better in some scenarios versus the new weapons. And that's all for this video. Let me know in the comments what you think of the BP weapons and if there's one in particular you are most excited for. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already, and I will see you all soon. Take care!